please join me in welcoming Professor Lyle Armstrong from Newcastle University, who's an expert in manipulating stem cells for the study and potential treatment of disease. Uh, Lyle works closely with Professor Linda Lacco at Newcastle, who's currently leading uh, a couple of Retin UK funded projects. Uh, Lyle and Linda had both hoped to join us in person today, but unfortunately the train um, engineering works between King's Cross and Newcastle have put paid for that. So um, Lyle is going to be joining us online. Helps if I unmute. Sorry about that. Okay, so th thanks for that introduction, Kate. That, that's, that's much appreciated. Um, and today, what I want to discuss is some of the work that we're doing to make to repair, to repair damaged retinas using stem cells. So I think if you can go to the next slide, please. I apologize, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not in control of the slides here since I couldn't be there in person. So the title of my talk is Invisible Cells to Fix the Damaged Retina. And it will become very apparent why they're invisible in, the, in, in a few slides time. But essentially what we're trying to do is to build a one size fits all type of therapy that we can use to repair retinal dystrophies and much more s impactful diseases such as age-related macular degeneration. So could we go to the next slide, please? So the problem we wish to solve, I think everyone in this audience will be very well aware of, of, of what we're trying to achieve here. Congenital retinal dystrophies are affecting one in every two to 3,000 people. So although they are rare diseases, they are not so rare. And they are affecting uh, the health and survival of photoreceptor cells in the areas where we can see in the bright field images on the left there. So areas around the macula, areas around the more light acuitive parts of the retina. So if we go to the next slide, please. And a significant proportion of those, of course, are met by age-related macular degeneration. Now this is a disease arising from a progressive array of retinal dysfunctions occurring both at the, if, if you can see the images where the blue and yellow arrows are jumping up and down. So that's a problem of the purple phase or the purple there, which is called the retinal pigmented epithelium and the lighter area sitting above that, which is the actual neural retina comprising the photoreceptors and the other cells, which will transfer signals from those back to the, to the optic nerve. Now, AMD is a significant problem. It's affecting currently about 170 million people worldwide. It is the third leading cause of legal blindness in the world. And this problem occurs, it comes in two forms. Um, initially, it starts out as a condition, sorry, I'm just closing my, my window because there's a street cleaner working. It starts as an accumulation of uh, waste products from the photoreceptor layer called drusen. And that occurs because the, uh, the purple cells, the RPE or retinal pigmented epithelium, don't work so well as we get older. So their ability to take nutrients and oxygen from the, the, the blood vessels below in the space called the choroid, and also to remove the waste products that are coming out of the photoreceptors, and I'll describe more what they actually are in a moment, that becomes diminished. So some of the waste products just build up in these little blobs called drusen. And you can see those if you look at the retinogram uh, on the right, hand part of this slide and you can see those little yellow patches sitting in the macula of a patient. Now that in itself has consequences for the neural retina, for the, the, for the photoreceptors. Obviously if they can't get access to oxygen and nutrients then those photoreceptors won't work very well anymore. Ultimately they will die and that causes a problem which again I'm sure everyone in this audience is very familiar with that the central field of vision becomes blank. It becomes ineffective in, in the patient. Now, the problem, of course, a major problem with wet a uh, dry AMD is it can become this more serious condition called wet AMD. 
And that occurs when the cells sitting above the patch of drusen say to themselves, hang on, we're not getting enough uh, nutrients and oxygen here. Let's send out signals to the blood vessels telling them to come and, come and help us out here. So they secrete this molecule, vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, which causes the blood vessels in the choroid to start growing up into the drusen patch. Now, sometimes that can resolve the problem with the drusen, but more often than not, it actually penetrates the layer of the retinal pigmented epithelium and up into the neural retina, causing catastrophic damage, which causes death and destruction of that whole area of photoreceptor tissue sitting above the drusen patch. And that is a major problem. So if we can go to the next slide, please. One of the great things that we're trying to do in the group that myself and Linda Lacker run in Newcastle is to try and find ways to fix these damaged areas. How can we replace them? Now, we've just had a great talk on gene therapy from Tara, so I don't intend to go into that in any great detail. And I believe we're having a talk on retinal prostheses later, so I, I, I won't touch that. What I will describe is the work that we're trying to do to build transplantable cells and moreover, cost-effective transplantable cells that we can put into any human patient. Basically, we would take photoreceptor progenitors and inject them, as we see in this, this uh, patient here, into the subretinal space, whereby we would expect that they can expand and integrate into the damaged retina and build a whole new layer of photoreceptors that can integrate with the optic nerve and can send signals back to the brain. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Now, I've mentioned pluripotent stem cells. Now, one of the things that I'm very guilty of in most of these lectures that I give is assuming that people know what pluripotent stem cells are. Uh, I, I beg your pardon if that is the case, but for those of us in the audience that don't know, I'd like to just spend a minute or so explaining what they are capable of doing. About 20 years ago, when Linda and I set up the group in Newcastle, one of our jobs was to derive some of the UK's first embryonic stem cell lines. And those we get by taking that very, very small area, it's about 64 cells out of a, a, a human blastocyst stage embryo, a thing called the inner cell mass or ICM, as you can see there on the left. And about 15% of those chunks of cellular material in the right conditions will grow to give colonies that look like the, the, the one which is immediately to the right of that ICM. Now, those are embryonic stem cells, and they're, they're wonderful cells because they're effectively immortal, they'll grow forever, but in doing that, they're not transformed in the way that cancer cells are. They will always retain the ability, given the right conditions, to differentiate into any of the cell types that you would find in the adult body. That's great. That work followed on about 15 years ago uh, from a chap called Shinya Yamanaka in Japan, who showed that you could take some of the genes, which are very, very strongly expressed in embryonic stem cells, and transfer those into, say, human skin cells. And that would produce something that looks very, very like uh, an embryonic stem cell, a thing that he termed induced pluripotent stem cells. And they're great because they do all of the things that embryonic stem cells do. But if we try to transplant those cells back into a human patient that they were derived from, the immune system cannot see them. It can't recognize that they are foreign cells. So the grafts will take, the cells will be therapeutically useful. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, one of the great things about pluripotent stem cells, of course, is that we can use them, as we say, to make any cell type in the adult body, including the retina. Now, for the sake of um, uh, brevity and also uh, the fact that this is a, a, a proprietary process to my spin-out company, New Cells Biotech, I'm not going to say exactly how we do it, but it's essentially we take 150 days to differentiate a ball of pluripotent stem cells into something that looks very, very much like an, a, a, a fetal retina. 
So it's got, at that, that point in day 150, it's got the photoreceptors on the outside. And all of these other cells that you can see, such as horizontal cells, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells, are all present on the internal face of that retinal organoid. Right, can we have the next slide, please? But, encouragingly, if we take those organoids, those little balls of cells apart, and we slice them up into, into thin sections, we can stain them with antibodies which show us that we have various cell types present. So, for example, in the top slide, the top panels of that slide, we can see that there are genes which are indicative of rod and cone photoreceptors. Similarly, we can see in the other slides that we've got horizontal cells and that we've got uh, bipolar cells present. And later on in development, we can produce similar slides to show that we have these things called ganglion cells, which are the ones which will transduce the electrical signals produced by the photoreceptors to the optic nerve and then back to the brain for interpretation. Now, of course, it's not enough for us to show that these cells are simply present. We have to show that they actually function. And in the next slide, yep, we, we're doing that. Now, this is a very busy slide, which I do want to take a little time to explain, because it's very important that anything that we make, any artificial construct that we make from stem cells, is capable of producing the same activity that a photoreceptor would be capable of in a live retina. And the site of action is where the blue circle and the arrow is up on, at the top of the left-hand panel. It's very, very important that if we make artificial photoreceptors, that they have these things called outer segments. Now, the outer segment is shown in more detail on the right-hand panel. And basically, it comprises a stack of discs, membrane-bound discs. And in those membranes, you can see some red and yellow and white colored uh, squiggles, which effectively represent the photoproteins or phototransduction proteins, rhodopsins, which are the, uh, the chemical basis of the response to light of a photoreceptor. So when a photoreceptor is illuminated, what will happen is that a molecule called 11 cis retinal, which is part of the rhodopsin protein, will basically change its shape. And in doing so, it will become energetically excited. And that means that it can send off a bunch of other signals to these little blue uh, cones, which are sitting on the outer membrane of the photoreceptor, which allows them to open and allow various types of ions to come into the cell. And that's basically like charging them up in the way you would charge an electrical battery. And once, once they are charged, they can then have the, enough energy to, to talk to these things called bipolar cells and make them send off signals back to the optic nerve. The problem with, those, with that process is that once the, the, the pigment, the rhodopsin, has been exposed to light, the 11 cis retinal can't be converted back to an unexcited form by the photoreceptor. To make that happen, it has to pump that material out into this other cell type, which is adjacent to it, called the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And they do all the chemical transformation to make new 11 cis retinal, which can be incorporated back into the, the photo pigment. Now, the reason that I um, diverged into that complex explanation is that we need to be able to show that the photoreceptors we make are capable of doing this. And if we go on to the next slide, please, we can see that that, well, first of all, we need to know that they're there. And these electron microscopy images show some relatively immature outer segments, as indicated by the blue arrow. But crucially, they do have these photopigment discs in them. And that's very important because that least suggests that these photoreceptors that we can make in the laboratory have, have the ability to respond to light. And the next slide should hopefully show us that that is the case. The way in which we, we, we determine whether they will work or not is that we, we cut the, uh, the little organoids in half and then we stick them onto these things called MEAs or multi-electrode arrays. Looks a bit like a bed of nails. Each one of those spikes coming up is an individual electrode, 
which interacts with the cells which are coming out from the photoreceptors that are generating the electrical signals. Now we can also show that um, the cells have the molecular machinery to respond to light by trying to fool it into thinking that it's been illuminated. So the rhodopsin, which you can see in this, this key-shaped uh, thing here, which is meant to represent an outer disk, once that's illuminated, that sets off a whole range of other chemical signals. It's G-protein coupled transduction, if, if anyone's interested. And essentially, that produces this molecule, this red blob sitting at the bottom here, a thing called cyclic GMP. And that's the key that opens up these photo, uh, sorry, these ion channels that allows the cell to depolarize and generate an electrical signal. Now we can know that these ion channels are present by adding uh, mimics or molecules which mimic the action of cyclic GMP, this thing called 8-bromocyclic GMP, 8-BRCGMP in the, in, the, in the side there. But the key outcome is when we shine light on the organoids attached to these MEAs, we get very, very similar outputs to these. We can see electrical signals being generated. So we feel confident that these cells actually work. They are light responsive. In a sense, they can see us coming. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So this led us to ask a question. If we can transplant these uh, cell types into animal models, are they able to integrate and grow and develop into a functional retina? So we used a particular type of animal, a particular type of mouse, which has a genetic mutation, which means that it can't make its own photoreceptors. So it's never been able to have a functional retina. All of the other parts of the retina are intact. So the bipolar cells, the retinal ganglion cells, all the other cells that will support the function of the photoreceptors are perfectly healthy, but they can't respond to light. So what we did, we took uh, our retinal organoid technology and we developed a way of isolating photoreceptor progenitor cells or precursors from those. And we injected those into the eyes or into the retinas of these dystrophic mice. Let them run around for a few weeks and then subjected them to visual behavior tests. And lo and behold, these mice, if you put them into mazes where they have a choice of going from a light area to a dark area, these mice were able to choose the dark area. So they were able to escape light, as mice are prone to do, in a way that their control animals, which were not injected with the cells, could not do. So on the basis of that result, we took uh, the retinas from several of these animals and subjected them to our multi-electrode array technology. And we could see areas in which cells, human cells, had integrated and were actually beginning to generate electrical signals, an actual response to light, which was a pretty amazing result. Now, of course, the question then becomes, this is an animal model. How do we turn this into a human therapy? And I think we'll go on to the next slide, please, if we can. What we need to do is to be able to build sufficient numbers of these cells to transplant into human patients. Now, we could use, of course, any old embryonic stem cell line or induced pluripotent stem cell line to make those. The problem is with doing that is that uh, I could take uh, or make an induced pluripotent stem cell line, say for myself, but I couldn't transplant that into any of the patients or any of the people sitting in this room because the immune system of those individuals would recognize those as foreign cells and try to get rid of them. Now, of course, you can immune suppress the patient. You can inject them with drugs, which will effectively slow down their immune system. But given that if we are seeking to treat uh, congenital retinal dystrophies, these transplants would have to take place fairly early in life. So you would be expecting to immune suppress a patient for maybe 50, 60, maybe 70 years. And that comes with significant health consequences infections not being the least problem of those but there are also problems associated with various types of tumor generation in long-term immunosuppression okay immune uh, uh, sorry uh, ipscs or induced pluripotent stem cells can be made for individual patients without the fear of immune rejection 
but, but for us to do that, let's let's say we wanted to do that for age-related macular degeneration, we would potentially be treating hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients. And that would mean an induced pluripotent stem cell line for each patient. The cost of that and the logistics of doing that are just frightening. The other possibility, of course, would be to use uh, an HLA haplotype-based bank of pluripotent stem cells, such as is the approach that they are trying in Japan, for example. But for significantly outbed populations, such as Europe and the, and the USA, that would still require significant numbers of lines. So the big question that we were asking ourselves is how can we make this so that we avoid immune rejection of the photoreceptor precursors in the first place? And hopefully in the next slide, I will be describing that. So our approach, we want to build an off the shelf transplantable uh, source of photoreceptors that can be used to treat any patient. So the way in which we do that, and I apologize that the, the slide hasn't come out terribly well, but essentially we're going to build, or we have built, what is called a hypoimmunogenic pluripotent stem cell bank. And what that means is that we've taken away some of the, the antigens, some of the proteins that sit on the surface of those cells, which allows the immune system to recognize them as either self or non-self. Now, this has several other advantages, of course. If we don't have to build uh, stem cell lines for individual people, then we can we can really focus on making this uh, a robust and reproducible manufacturing process, whereby we can we can really fine tune the ability to make photoreceptor progenitors from these cells. So, to just to, to confirm, our aim is to build an off-the-shelf product no immune suppression, no donor matching, no rejection. So a, a cost-effective means of generating photoreceptors for anyone who needs them. So in the next slide, I think I just summarize what we're how this will actually work. So if, if we can go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Well, Basic, ah, yes, there we go. So essentially what what is what the immune system uses to identify whether a cell belongs to the to the body of the patient are these things called HLA class one on antigens. So they will be interrogated by a particular type of lymphocyte called a, a CD8 T cell. And if it if it sees them, that's great. And if it sees that they're your antigens, wonderful, it leaves you alone. But if it detects that the HLA antigen is from a different person, then it will start lysing that particular cell. It'll punch holes in it so that it, it basically bleeds to death. So what we've done, we've knocked out that thing completely. We've taken one of the uh, proteins that it helps the cell to build those antigens of the surface, thing called beta do uh, microglobulin. And without those uh, antigens being there, the T cells come along, bump into the cell, don't see what they're expecting to see and, and go away confused. But there are other types of T lymphocytes which will come along and interrogate other antigens on the surface which need to be present. So we have to make sure that the cells we make express those so that they won't, so that they'll go away confused as well. Other types of cells called macrophages will interrogate a protein called CD47 sitting on the surface of the cell. So we have to actively express that to make sure that macrophages do not attack the transplanted cells. And similarly, we have to include other antigens such as HLAG, HLAE, et cetera, which will keep the, these things called natural killer cells from attacking our cells. So essentially, we've built a pluripotent stem cell line now, which we are in the process of differentiating into photoreceptors, which we hope in the near future to be taking, well, first to animal trials, but uh, eventually someday we hope to be taking these to human trials so that we can build something, if we can just go to my summary slide, please, to the last slide. Last slide, there we go. So essentially, we'll be able to build a relatively cost-effective resource that we can, using our uh, retinal organoid technology, 
to be able to build cells that can integrate into a damaged human retina, say a one that's suffering from um, a retinal dystrophy or from age-related macular degeneration, and that those cells will be able to repair and regenerate those damaged part of the retina and at least regain some of the visual acuity in those patients. Now, that's a prospect which uh, excites me and, and, and Linda very much. Um, and I hope to be able to report a lot more clinical findings in, in the very near future. So I'd like to thank you for, for listening. I think I've probably overshot, but that, that's me. I do that sort of thing. Um, and if anyone has any questions at the panel session, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Lyle, um, and uh, Lyle will hopefully join us for the Q&A a little bit later.